For French underwater archaeologist Luc Long, this is the latest step in his quest to discover the source of the wreck he's investigating off the Côte d'Azur, the largest antique wreck yet found. Now he's searching among a thousand acres of tombs in Tuscany. Long before the Romans, their builders, the mysterious Etruscans, dominated Italy and flourished throughout the Mediterranean basin. This was where the people of the town of Cairo honored their dead. Enormous tumuli rise up from the ground, 2,700 years old, sculpted out of volcanic rock. Some of them reach almost 50 meters across. Around them lie more simple graves. Almost uniform in design, these are pointers to the existence of a middle class, merchants made wealthy by trade. For Luc, examining this city of the dead with its streets and squares is the closest he can come to walking the lost world of the Etruscans. Many of the various influences that inspired the Etruscan city are still visible. Right-angled streets in the style of the Greeks, oriental design cornices decorating the fronts of buildings. The interiors of the tombs show Luke what Etruscan homes looked like with entrance halls, rooms, and corridors. He can clearly identify the characteristics of Roman houses of the future. Below ground is an astonishing insight into the daily life of a wealthy Kairi family. The walls of the tomb are covered in raised plaster models of household possessions and even pets. Other tombs in Tarquinia revealed a ruling class's love of banquets and symposia where people came together to drink wine. The Etruscans loved dancing and wrestling, regularly organizing nationwide games. Activities that were previously believed to be Roman in origin can be seen among the Etruscans much earlier. Among them circus games, theater, and chariot racing. Objects found in the tombs, like this terracotta sarcophagus from the end of the 6th century BC, demonstrate how developed Etruscan culture was. In most ancient funeral monuments, the figures are very often set apart. Not here. They're a couple enjoying a banquet. The man looks lovingly at the woman, his right hand on her shoulder. She leans against her companion with confidence and trust. Etruscan woman is shown on the same level as man. It's interesting because it plunges us into an atmosphere totally different to banquet scenes on Greek pottery. Pottery from ancient Athens or Corinth where we can see that, ultimately, the Greek banquet was strictly for men. Greek women were only allowed to take part as musicians or as courtesans. There is further evidence of the privileged status of women in Etruria in their names. The Etruscans would often add the name of their mother Men were not just the son of Mr. So-and-so, but also the son of Mrs. Such-and-Such. When a woman not only has a family name, but also an individual identity within the family, she has a privileged status compared to a Greek or Roman woman who would always be anonymous behind her husband and family.
Luke now has a clearer picture of a people bridging east and west with their coastal trade. His curiosity and energy are renewed. And although no Etruscan boat has been found before, he has a growing conviction that the wine vessels he has discovered are not a part load, but themselves the major cargo. How many amphoras could be in the consignment? And how were they loaded? As he's found other objects too, were these part of the shipment wedged in among the wine containers? It's time to experiment. After the amphoras have spent a few weeks in fresh water to combat two and a half thousand years of sea salt, Luke prepares to reconstruct the method of loading. Until now, no one had imagined that amphoras could have been stacked one on top of another. It would have big implications for the size of boat necessary to carry such a weight. Luke wants to see how high they can stack them. They fit them together guided by marks of wear. It's a kind of three-dimensional jigsaw puzzle. With five layers, the pots would reach one meter sixty. With the number of amphoras they have per square meter, even with just four layers, Luke concludes the ship would need to be more than 20 meters long to carry a little over 30 tons. So this is already one of the biggest commercial ships from antiquity, over 30 tons, carrying in the region of seven to eight hundred amphoras. The next test is to see how the load was secured. Luke's theory is that the Etruscans used vines because he found many of them among the wreckage and there are signs of rope-like wear. Luke has ascertained there's no way to put either dishes, plates or the bronze bowls between the amphoras. So in fact they were where the divers found them, piled up on top. With barely space to get a hand in, they could not have been wedged in between the amphoras. Their discovery will have to be verified. Is their stacking method a one-off or a tried and tested technique? Certainly there appear to be marks as if twisted vines were used. Perhaps they were tied to form bunches like grapes or lashed down for stability at sea. In order to be certain, Luke visits the fort stock of Etruscan amphoras from other excavations to see if they bear similar scars. He's certain he can see similar marks on other amphoras. Luke is struck by one pot straight away. It didn't come from his expedition. The researchers have had it for at least 30 years. Lashing the pots together is a system that was widely used. It's not just related to one wreck. Luke has new answers and a fresh puzzle to obsess him. If he has identified the first large merchant ship of the ancient world, Etruscan, 2,500 years old, carrying 30 tons of cargo, a single batch of 700 pottery jars stacked several layers high, all containing wine, then where was it heading? And who was the shipment for? French archaeologist Luc Long pursues his inquiries. 
He has assembled enough evidence to suggest that the oldest untouched wreck ever found left Tuscany with a shipload of wine, but what was its destination? The ship left the Etruscan city of Caere's port of Pirgi and sailed west. The location of the wreck and cargo point towards Gaul. Luke goes beyond Marseille to Lat. There, archaeologist Michel P is unearthing the remains of a major port, with many signs the Etruscans were there. Michel tells him the site was originally on the edge of a lagoon, because ships could reach here. Its builders took advantage of the ease of access for ships to develop a major port during the Iron Age. First Etruscans used it, then people from Marseille, then Italians, then Romans. The whole history of Mediterranean commerce is written in the dig here. Luke is anxious to find out if the port was functioning in the late 6th or early 5th century BC and whether Etruscan goods were passing inland. Michel P. is quick to confirm that the time of the wreck was during the period when the site was founded. The port started out on a grand scale. All the ramparts were built at the same time. The town covered several acres right from the beginning, and the impact of this new development on the area inland can be easily traced. The Etruscan amphoras found in this area outnumber those in Marseille or even the local county. This must be due to regular shipments of which the wreck could be one example. Michel shows Luke one of the old entrances, right at the edge of the lagoon. The tree line is where the lagoon was in antiquity. In fact, the area has changed a lot. The port has silted up. At first, the ships would have arrived on a beach before a solid port was set up. So it's a typical example of a harbour where foreign middlemen would come and trade with locals. Excavations here have gone on for many years. Finally, Michel is able to show Luke an area where there were two rooms and a kind of narrow storeroom crammed with broken Etruscan amphoras, about a dozen of them. His impression is that it was a place for selling wine. The digs provide other evidence that Etruscan traders settled in this part of Gaul. In the museum at Lat, Michel points out exhibits with Etruscan markings on them, probably indicating who owned them. Luke wonders, if the markings are in Etruscan, were there people from round here who wrote in Etruscan, or were there really Etruscans here? Michel is almost certain that these are the signatures of people from Etruria who were here. He's convinced that the Etruscans lived here, not just delivering goods, because writing isn't learnt overnight. One crucial point remains to be checked. Are the amphoras from the wreck the same type as those from the Etruscan warehouses in Lat? Ah, voilà. Luke has brought examples from the wreck to compare them with those dug up at Lat. His are complete and heavier. The two men notice that the pottery clay looks quite similar to the naked eye. It's a characteristic dark red-brown color. They're convinced it's from the same source. Luke is also keen to solve another mystery. Luke has noticed bronze bowls similar to the bowls found on the wreck. Professor Garcia tells him they were used for drinking. In fact, they're the equivalent of a wine tasting cup or a drinking cup. The Etruscans drank wine from these, probably passing them round, seeing as they would contain quite a lot. Dominique's conclusion is that the Etruscans not only spread wine throughout southern Gaul, but also how to drink it. 
The amphora, once it had been emptied, was thrown away. It was disposable. Whereas for the Gauls, the cups were quite clearly prestigious possessions. They aren't found in homes, they're found in tombs, which clearly means that people wanted to be buried with a symbol of access to drink. In reality, not everyone would be entitled to this kind of cup. Luke found about 40 on the ship, for an elite perhaps, or at least for people who knew how to behave like Etruscans. Another similarity between the area around Lat and the wreck. But why was wine so prized by the Gauls? If you look at the overall pattern of imports, they really didn't want much else that the Greeks or Etruscans had. It was really entirely centered around wine and drinking vessels. Uh, before the, the uh, monetization of the economy and the development of uh, uh, paid labor, one of the only ways to really mobilize a large number of people for a specialized task, like building a house or a wall or a road or something like that, was to call people together and offer them a large feast. When one begins to think about alcohol and its role in all of these uh, social and uh, political aspects of life, then one can begin to understand the, the social logic that lies behind this beverage. Uh, the wine probably had a slightly higher alcohol content than the native beers, which means that its, this is, its psychoactive properties would have been augmented in the important uh, intoxicating uh, aspects that are very important, you know, often in rituals. Uh, and there's also the, just the exoticness of the product itself. So the fact that it was a beverage which came from somewhere else in which they had no, uh, no way of knowing how to make themselves. Ten months after beginning his investigation, Luke seizes the chance to return to the wreck. He has to find out whether against all odds after two and a half thousand years, remains of the ship's hull still exist hidden beneath the layers of sand-bound amphoras. The dives begin again in earnest. The atmosphere is tense. The stakes are colossal. No hull of an Etruscan ship has ever been found. For Luke and his team, the mission is clear. First, they must gradually remove the layers of amphora over a small area in order to discover if anything is concealed below. Only when these are cleared away and documented can they open a shaft into the seabed. There proved to be at least four layers of wine containers. If any timbers have been preserved, they could open a whole new chapter in the lost history of the Etruscans. Once more, the blaster aims a precise jet into the mud. On August the 11th, 2001, a rib appears, part of the interior of a hull. There really is a ship there, entombed in the mud 30 fathoms down. The 150 amphoras recovered so far must only be a fraction of the cargo. There are yet more discoveries to be made about Etruscan ship materials and design. A clearer picture is forming. The wreck still conceals many secrets. It's a staggering find a ship of unprecedented size, over 20 meters long and seven meters wide, complete with cargo. 
and she may provide clues to the mystery of the disappearance of the Etruscans. Had they indeed foreseen that their world would come to an end? They also had a system of recognizing the future of their own society, how long it would last on Earth, by calculating something called secular in Latin, which we might translate as great generations. And the Etruscans thought that for them, there were only a certain number of generations. And when they were gone, there would be no more Etruscans left. And they were right. By the first century BC, at the time of the Roman Emperor Augustus, the Etruscans and their empire had vanished. Yet the wreck must wait a little longer to reveal its last secrets. Its location carefully guarded against pillagers. Luke's search has brought him unexpected answers. He knows that a ship set out from the port of Pyrgi near Caeri, heading for the south of France, perhaps the port of Lat. There it would have landed its cargo, a batch of 700 pottery jars stacked several layers high, containing wine. He knows they're made of Etruscan clay, and the design on a cup on board has given him a name for the wreck, the Pagros. Marks on the amphoras have taught him how Etruscan cargoes were loaded, stacked on themselves. Yet the 30-ton cargo never reached the thirsty Gauls. Luke can finally imagine the last moments of the Pagros. Two and a half thousand years ago, this was the fate of the largest merchant ship of the ancient world ever found. Our World War I season continues on Thursday night at 9 here on 4, focusing on the civilian population in horror on the home front. Even severe